But I am going to ask the question, how many of us have been implementing the previous life apps, been implementing the spiritual disciplines that we've been walking through? You know, like the battle app of prayer. If we feel like we're in a, we're, we're in a war and we're losing the war, how much time have we spent in battle? How about the heart app of worship? Making sure that our heart is in the right place at the right time to hear God. And that only comes through celebration. It comes through worshiping Him. It comes through honoring Him and glorifying His name for who He is in my life and in your life. If it wasn't for the, the, the heart of worship, I couldn't give God glory for a dollar eight shirt. You know? And if I can give him glory for a dollar eight shirt, then he gets glory for everything else that is far weightier and valuable than a shirt. Or the privacy app where we talked about silence and solitude, shutting off the noise. Even if you don't open your mouth, just shut down the noise. The selfie app, which we went three weeks on that, of reflection and meditation. Do we see who God sees? And does the world see who God sees? And all of these things that we've been talking about is in God's app store. His word. Everything that we have need of that is essential to living this life fulfilled and abundant is in his word. If we don't crack the book, open the app then we miss out on those things that God wants to speak to us in those moments. And for those of you, whoever's running the slides, if you can move to the next slide. If you've missed any of the Life App series, you can get caught up. So you can write that down and put it into your phone or your, don't do it now because it'll bring up a video and it'll start playing, okay? So just put it in your notes or wherever and then you can go and get caught up if you have missed these these messages. And it's not because they're great messages and I'm such a great speaker. It's because there are nuggets of truth that God wants us to grab a hold of. And it's essential that we speak the same language. It's essential that we are unified in our body as we walk through the things that God is calling us to do. Amen? And calling us to be. So you can write that down. That'll take you to where we have all of our videos archived. Um, in there, at the top right corner, you'll see the Trinity Christian Center logo. You can click on that, and you can actually see all of the messages that we have on video. And you can go back all the way the last couple years and catch up on some of those things. So this week, we're going to release the health app. The health app. If you saw, I probably posted it earlier as the workout app, but as God really started to, to pull all this together within me, I felt it essential that I would call this the health app. The health app is one of my most used apps. Even more so than my social media apps, more so than <clears throat> um, my music app or my, my calendar app. My health app is the most used app that I have right now. See, the funny thing about the health app is this, it really doesn't do anything. See, the health app within itself has no major function. When you bring up your music app, what does it do? It plays music. When you bring up your, your message app, what does it do? It allows you to communicate one with another. Your social media app, you get to be social in engagement with others. See, there's all, most other apps have a function that they do and a, and a, or a service that it provides out of that. The health app does not do that. What it's good for is this, and why I use it is that it gathers data from all of my other health-related apps. When I talked about the heart app, I shared a little bit about the, the heart app, what's, what it does on my, on my watch and, and, <clears throat> and, and how it can keep track of the beats per minutes and, and things like that. But the heart app that I use is only one piece of data that gets fed to my health app. See, during this series, 
And we've talked about the heart app, that as long as I have my watch on, it measures my heart rate throughout the day. It alarms me when my heart rate has anomalies and spikes, which actually I had one of those this week. My resting heart rate in, in a single instance went from 59 beats to 192 beats in a single instance. And so my watch, my watch went off. Now, what I didn't tell you is I happened to be at the eye doctor who put on a blood pressure cuff at that exact same moment. So anytime I go to any, anybody that has the word doctor in front of it, my, I have this spike in heart rate. Even if it's the eye doctor, I was at the dentist and my heart rate jumped to 172 and I'm laying down on the table and it just spikes and then they have to take my blood pressure and then they'll, they'll take it again afterwards and it'll go from 190 something over 120 to 130 over 100 in a single instance. So it alarms me if my heart rate has anomalies and spikes and so it does. You know, and I've talked about my food app, you know, where I put in the, what I ate for the day and it tracks my, my calorie intake, it, ca- it tracks protein intake, ca- it tracks uh, salt, it, tr- it tracks sugar, carbohydrates, it tracks all of those things on what I put in there. I've talked about my weight app, my weight app measures just that, my weight, where my weight fluctuates and then it calculates a body mass index or it calculates a body fat uh, index or, and it even calculates a hydration level that I have. Um, we have a, uh, a scale in our bathroom that does the exact same thing. It gives me four key indicators based upon my body. I've talked about my sleep app. You know, many of you may not know this, but a few, several years ago, I was, uh, I was uh, highly heavier than what I am now. And I was going through a period of apnea. Um, I was working shift work, uh, predominantly overnight. And so in the middle of the night, it was not uncommon for Becky to be waken, woken up out of her sleep because I stopped breathing, you know. And so I uh, went to a neurologist and, and, you know, I had to go through the sleep study. The problem with the sleep study is I spent five grand and it was inconclusive. If you ever get the opportunity to go to a sleep study, I will tell you this right off the bat, you will not sleep. They kept waking me up every time something was going on, and they're like, are you okay? Yes, I was sleeping, and I was sleeping good. They said, well, something registered. Uh, I said, yes, because I was sleeping, and I was sleeping good. <laughs> now I'm not sleeping, and I'm awake, and I'm ticked off. <clears throat> but anyway, so I do have a sleep app to, to watch that, to, watch, to, to monitor my sleep in the middle of the night, particularly when I know that there, I have high stress levels. And then, of course, as I've shared, you know, I have my workout app. Oh, uh, All of these apps, they track and manage my nutritional health, my physical body, my hydration, my my mass. They track my restfulness, and they track all of my workout activities. That's really all they do is they are all trackers that provide a resource, and all of this gets rolled up. So these would be considered sub-apps of the health app. They're independently done, but they all provide something else. In my health app, I have my age, and it has my birth date so that it continues to increment my age every year. It has my height and my weight. It has my blood type. It has my current medications. It has all of my allergies. It even has my medical history as well as my emergency contacts. I keep my health health app updated at all times. My health app can be accessed without unlocking my phone. As a matter of fact, there's a feature on our watches that if I'm in distress, I can hold down a button and it will send a 911 message to all of my family. It will tell them exactly where I am. It shows up on a map and they can contact EMS if they had to based upon my watch. You see, so the health app takes all this data And it provides me with a real-time overall health analysis. At any time, I can pull up this health app and see a real-time snapshot of its best. Remember I said its best, because it's taking all of the information coming in, of its best picture of my health. It tracks, act, or it tracks activity of what my current calorie burn is, how many exercise minutes I have, even how often I stand. Matter of fact, if I don't stand for any, any length of time, it will tell me that it's time to stand. 
When you're on a plane and the fasten your seatbelt sign is on and you get the, the thing that says tell you to stand, the stewardess does not care that your app told you to stand. You need to sit back down. Don't ask me how I know. <clears throat> you know. You know I can be a smart butt at times and I said my watch told me I needed to stand. Uh, sir, can you please sit back down? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Don't need no trouble at 30,000 feet, you know. But it tracks all of this, you know, the, the activity that's going on. It tracks what my current calorie burn is. So I can look now and see how many calories have I burned since I woke up and put my watch on. How many exercise minutes? And you would not believe this, but I actually get about 45 exercise minutes every Sunday morning when I preach. I do anywhere between three to five miles when I come up here until the time I sit down. So it tracks all of my exercise minutes. It even breaks it down a little bit farther. Not only the number of times that I stood, but how long I've been on my feet. How many active calories and resting calories? Did you know that you will burn about one-third of your total calorie is in a day resting? That's not doing exercise. So resting is healthy. Remember that. Not only does it tell me how often I stand, how long I stand, it tracks the number of steps that I've taken. It tracks the total distance, whether it's walking or running, it gives me a total distance that I've done for the day. Oh, and here's a good one. It actually tracks the number of flights of stairs I take. The heart app, which we've talked about already, it tracks my overall heart rate, my resting rate, my active rate, and it also gives a variability, meaning how, what is the time frame between each beat? Right now, my variability is right at 70 milliseconds. I don't know what healthy is, but that's what it is. It tracks my VO2, which is my oxygen consumption during exercise. Currently, I'm at 51.85 milliliters of oxygen when I exercise, which used to be at the beginning of the year 44.76 milliliters of oxygen. And yes, the higher number is better in this case. Even more, it has the ability to connect to other health-related apps and use smart scales, blood pressure, and blood, device, blood sugar devices. This particular health app can connect to as many sub-apps and as many devices as I want to even give me a more clearer picture on what my over -health, overall health is. You know, with so many options, I almost don't have to see a doctor. Almost. The health app doesn't have the ability to make us healthier. You see, with all this information that's being fed to this one app that can give me a real-time snapshot, it does not have the ability to make me healthier. It, it cannot do anything to physically motivate me to be a healthier person. Only thing it can do is track all of the things that I'm already doing and give me a report based upon the input that it receives. Nothing more, nothing less to give me a best picture of that health. It has no ability to make me work out. It has no ability to force me to stand even though it tells me to stand. It does not have any ability to exercise power and authority over me to get those things done. See, my workout, attempt, my workout app does attempt to do that. It reminds me every three days that it's been three days since my last workout. Oh, shut up. <laughs> and if that's not bad enough, my favorite is this. It even tries to call me out at 4 a.m. in the morning and says, you used to think this was a good time to work out. I'm convinced Becky has programmed that into my workout app. <laughs> that way the notification comes from the app and not from her. I'm, I'm convinced that she's saying, man, he's not getting up. I'll teach him. <laughs> See, even then, unless I become intentional in my workout or become intentional in, in whatever app that I'm, I'm using to track my overall health, it can only track it when I actually do something about it. It doesn't tell me what my potential health is. It can only tell me what my current health looks like as it relates to what I've invested in. 
See, just like our natural health app that attempts to measure our actual health, God's health app truly measures our overall health of our being. See, God has an app to measure that. He has an app to measure our spirit, our soul, and our body. God's health app is called faithfulness. God's health app is called faithfulness. See, the heart app doesn't make me faithful, but it reveals the level of my faithfulness. Did you hear what I said? The health app does not make me more faithful or active or intentional, but it definitely tells me what the level of my faithfulness, whether I have been faithful in my workout or not. <clears throat> and so faithfulness is not an action, but an attribute. Faithfulness is an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. It is the result of intentional, responsive kingdom action. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And you know I've taught here that, that every attribute of the fruit of the Spirit can only come by the fruit or the root of the fruit which is love. In our English language, we've, we've, we've been given this context that there are nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, but in reality, the statement is the fruit of the Spirit is love. And instead of a comma, it should be a semicolon or a colon. And the ne next eight are attributes that flow out of love. Those next eight attributes are non-existent without love. The only way that those things can be identified is through the pure heart of love, unconditional love in God. Patience, you can't do anything to be patient. I guarantee if you love someone that is trying your patience, you will find patience. I guarantee if we exercise the love of God as we're supposed to, we will discover the attributes of love in our life. And faithfulness is only an attribute of that love in our life. Out of all those, I look at faithfulness and I view it as the measuring and tracking tool equivalent to our health app. It's the measuring and tracking tool of love. Just like the health app is a measuring and tracking tool of my health, faithfulness is the measuring and tracking tool of love. Silence overtook the crowd. Psalm 25 and 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. The path, all the paths of the Lord, every path that leads us to the Lord and every path from the Lord come out of steadfast love and faithfulness. Faithfulness means firm and constant observ observance of duty, performance of obligation, loyalty, and true to one's word. See, when we are faithful, people can witness our faithfulness. See, it is the observance. It's a firm and constant observance of the duty and performance of obligation, loyalty, and truth of one's word in action. 
Faithfulness is the observance. It's the evidence of love. We always wonder, what does love look like? Well, love looks like faithfulness. When a husband and a wife are faithful to one another, what does it look like? Love. We don't go and look at at a couple that's faithful to one another and we go, oh, look at their faithfulness. No, we immediately say they are in love. There is evidence that they love one another. Because the faithfulness in the marriage, the faithfulness one to another, the faithfulness in our love relationship with Christ is evident in the marriage. And so faithfulness becomes that evidence of love. We love God in faith, period. You cannot love God outside of faith. Faith is the only way that we can love God because our carnal nature is opposed to God. It does not want to love God. It is at war with God. So the only way that we can love God is by faith, period. We love God in faith. Our response is to be faithful to his commands. And the evidence of our response to faith in loving God is our faithfulness. I have faith that if I work out, I will be healthier. You see how that works? I can have faith that if I work out, I will be healthier. But if I sit on that chair and all I have is faith to believe that if I worked out, I would get healthier, I'm not getting healthier. I just have the faith that if I did it, I would get healthier. You see, it's the same concept. If I have faith in God, but I am not intentional about walking out his commands, then I can have all the faith in God, but am I really faithful? James says that that faith absent of works, faith absence of corresponding response in the spirit is dead. Having faith in God with no faithful actions does not produce faithfulness. There must be a corresponding response in the spirit that produces the evidence of faithfulness, produces the evidence that we have faith in God, produces the evidence that we are faithful. So unless I am faithful in my workouts, I have not exercised my faith in working out. My workout app will track my faithfulness in my workouts. In other words, no workout to track, no faithfulness in my workout health period. I can share that with other people too. So if I really wanted to up my level of tracking and accountability, I can share my workout apps with you. And instead of getting notifications just from the app, I could get notifications from you and say, hey, pastor, you haven't worked out in three weeks. I kind of noticed you put on about five extra pounds up there. You're looking a little round on the video lately, buddy. There's a reason why I've not shared that with y'all. You see, no one will ever know if I wasn't faithful in a workout or two or three. You wouldn't know that. She'll know that. My sassy app will tell me because it knows that. But you will never know if I missed a workout or two. Joe Frazier, when he was was, the champion, when he fought uh, Muhammad Ali... He said, no one is ever going to know that you missed a few workouts. No one's ever going to know that until the day of the championship fight. Because champions aren't discovered in the ring of the championship fight. They're discovered in the workout. They're discovered in their faithful actions, their faithful response to why they're working out and what their goal is. You see, the faithfulness of the fighter is revealed in the ring. And if he's shown himself faithful in all of his workouts, he will become the champion, the overcoming conqueror, the one who is victorious. You see, those are synonymous kind of with our walk with God, aren't they? We like to say that we're a champion, but we don't want to do things that make us champions. We say that we're victorious, but we do nothing in acts or responses to victory. See, again, no one's going to know 
if I lacked faithfulness in a workout or two or three. No one is going to know if we miss a day of Bible reading. No one's going to know if we've missed prayer, worship, silence, and meditation. No one's going to know that if you miss it once or twice or three times. However, over time, it will become evident that we've missed several workouts because you will see a little more roundness. You, if you don't believe me, go watch a video from December 2015 to about March, April of, December, or of uh, 2016. And then look at videos from last year in the same time frame. And you will see about a 30 to 40 pound difference. And then look at videos from last first quarter and look at the videos from this first quarter. And you will see a different 30 or 40 pound difference. You see, no one knows that I've missed those workouts once or twice a week or two. But over time, you will begin to see that I am no longer faithful in the workout because it is revealed in my faithfulness. See, my lack of being faithful revealed the fruit of my faithfulness. So no one's going to know if we missed our Bible reading today. No one's going to know if we missed our prayer time today. No one's going to know if we missed our silence and our meditation and our reflection today. But faithfulness becomes the gauge and the barometer for everything. Faithfulness will begin to reveal over time that we have not been faithful in our Bible reading, that we have not been faithful in our prayer time. We have not been faithful in those things that God has called us to. Once or twice is not going to kill us, and once or twice is not going to send us to heaven. As a matter of fact, if you cut out Bible reading and worship and everything, everything of spiritual discipline, if you cut it all out of your life, you probably will still go to heaven. And I say probably because I don't know definitively. I don't know each person's heart. It's not for me to judge either way, okay? But I'm going to say, give us all the benefit of the doubt, we'll probably still go to heaven. But we will miss out on the fullness of this life while we're here on earth. We miss out on everything that God has ordained for us to walk through today. And each and every day that we have breath. Wiley, I'm convinced you're not finished yet because God's not done with you yet. I'm convinced. You might think it's just because you're just flat out ornery and you're, not, you're going to outlast the devil. <laughs> but God says, God says that he's created that in you and he's not done with you yet. <laughs> Faithfulness becomes our gauge and our barometer, becomes like our measuring tool. That when we commit to something and we are intentionally faithful to that commitment, our faithfulness is revealed. If we've committed to God and we're faithful in that commitment to Him, the fruit of that is going to be faithfulness. People will begin to see the evidence of our faithfulness in Christ. And it's not because you, 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 you memorize Scripture and you quote Scripture. They're going to see it in our actions. They're going to see it in who we are. They're going to see it in our language. And how we love one another. We don't, listen, if we are truly walking out this life in, in faith like we are called to, we would actually be just like the disciples. The disciples didn't have to go around quoting what they saw. People saw it in them. They were called Christians in Antioch, not because they were preaching and, and doing all kinds of stuff. They, it was revealed to them that they looked, they act, they spoke like Jesus. That's when they were first called Christians, little Christ. The image of Christ, they saw it in everything they were. See, earlier this year, we walked through spiritual excellence in our Living Transformational series. If you recall, I spoke on, on four areas within spiritual excellence. And they were our time, our talent, our skill, our energy, and our resources. See, where we invest those will also reveal our faithfulness. Where we invest our time is going to reveal our faithfulness. 
Where we invest our talent and our skill, it's going to reveal our faithfulness. Where we invest our energy and exhaust our energy, it's going to reveal our faithfulness. Where we exhaust, I mean, invest our resources is going to reveal our faithfulness. Everything that we put into practice is going to reveal what we are faithful towards. For instance, if someone is constantly late to everything, whether it be work or church or school or, 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 or to jobs or whatever it is, this is a fact. It reveals a lack of faithfulness. I, look, guys, I'm, I, I want to share something with you. I am, I am a very patient person, and she will explain to you. I am, I am patient about a lot of things, and I am, con, I am accommodating in a lot of things. I understand there are, there, are, there are more things beyond James that are going on in people's life. I, I get that, okay? I, I, I understand that. I don't want anyone to think that I don't understand that. But at the same time, understanding that our actions reveal a certain level of honor, a certain level of respect, a certain level of faithfulness in the things that we do. You know, talking to other pastors, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, the, the topic of like of, 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 of congregations and things that go on in our congregation. We have these, these talks, conversations of, of appreciation, you know, and like pastor appreciation month or pastor appreciation day and things like that. And, and so, you know, we're, we're having these conversations and I tell people, I said, you know what? Just like my kids at home, you know what I appreciated the most from my kids was not when they told me they loved me. It wasn't when they told me that they admire me or that I'm their hero. None of that revealed appreciation towards me. You know when I knew that they loved me and appreciated me? When the dishes got done and no one had to ask them to do that. When the trash got taken out and taken to the street on trash day and they didn't have to be asked to do that. When you walk by their room and it doesn't smell like gym socks because they picked them up and put them in the laundry to be washed and their beds are made and, 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 the, and the room is, is straight. As, as a parent living at home, those spoke volumes to us more than them saying, I love you and I appreciate you. More than getting a gift on our anniversary or birthday or Mother's Day and Father's Day. Do you know, even today, them being willing to go out of their way, step out of their lives, and to, to show themselves that what we appreciate, they don't have to get us a gift. But if my kids, you know, here's, here's the thing that I tell them. Y'all don't have to come see me on Father's Day. Y'all don't have to come, you don't even have to contact me on my birthday. My anniversary is not about me. I said, but you will you will consider calling your mother. You will consider gathering on a day that is important to her. And I said, in what you do for her, you have already honored and respected me. Yes. You see, that, and that's, that's, that's my viewpoint on, on, on when you talk about faithfulness. The more faithful my children are to my wife, I'm the happiest father around. In business, I did the same thing. You don't have to honor me because I'm your boss. Honor me because you, you understand the principles that I'm teaching you. Honor me that when you're on that phone with that customer, you think for that minute, when that customer says, I want to talk to your boss, you think for the minute, if I hand this call off to James, what is James going to do in this situation? And if this is what James is going to do, then that means he's also empowered me to do the exact same thing. I told a supervisor one time, he kept escalating and escalating and escalating. And I told him, Frank, I said, if you keep escalating your calls to me, why do I need you? I've empowered you to make decisions as a supervisor. And if you won't make decisions and be intentional in the tools that I've empowered you to, to exercise, why do I need you? In ministry, I, I will I share this. You know what honors me the most as, as the pastor or leading people in ministry? Is taking care of the little things and being faithful in the little things. You know, the little things like I touched on, you see trash, pick up the trash. You know, something needs done, do it. Chairs need straightened up, straighten the chairs. Do you know when I stacked all these chairs up I was intentional. Many of y'all thought, well, why doesn't he want us to help him 
uh, put the chairs back up. I was intentional about it because I needed to walk through something, and I'll share with you what I needed to walk through. When I pulled all these chairs apart, it's pretty disgusting. There are snotty Kleenexes in between almost every chair. Gum and gun wrappers and candy wrappers. Yeah, y'all are looking down now. They're not there anymore. I cleaned them off. As I pulled every chair apart, stuff just fell out between each chair. Do you know, as I'm doing that, I'm starting to grieve and I'm starting to, 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 to get sad. These aren't my chairs. This, this is, this is the, the facilities that God has given all of us to be stewards over. And, 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 and if you know the emotional cycle, after I got sad and grieved, what do you think happened next? I got angry. Angry. And, and then my anger turned even into this seething, almost bitterness. Because with each row that I stacked, I saw who sat where. And the worst thing that could happen to me happened that day is I put faces to that anger. And I'm stacking every one of these chairs, and I am just so angry at the people who sit in these rows and these chairs. That's why I said, don't bother putting them back, because I needed to process through that myself. And then as I cleaned up each chair and put it back, in place, I reminded myself that this, this is why we're here. But I think we've lost sight of certain things. You know what makes, you know what will reveal honor and faithfulness? It's taking care of little things. If you see a snot, if you have a snotty rag, take it to the trash. There's trash over there. <laughs> There's trash in there. There's trash in the bathrooms. You know, just the little things. Uh, half empty water bottles. The church has water, and, and, and it's, it's free for everyone to, to, to drink. But man, if you have a half-empty water bottle, don't leave it laying around. Take it in the trash or take it home. You know what we do with half-empty water bottles in our house? We put them in the dog's water bowl so they don't go to waste. It's, it's the little things. So I say that because I want you all to hear my heart this morning, that there are little things that... I'm trying to teach us that if we can take care of those little things, all of the big things are going to reveal itself. We're going to be amazed at what happens in the little things. Those of us that were in the military, we understand these things. If you raise the subject of a hospital corner, most of us are going to cringe at that, huh, Tony? <laughs> Hella fun. <laughs> it is simple now. But when you're first in basic and you're told about a hospital corner and you're getting demerits because you can't get that stupid hospital corner right, the last thing you want to hear is you grow up as a hospital corner. So y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Anna might know. Anna might know. <laughs> you know? And, and my, my pastor, Billy Sanders, we were sharing, and I, and I was telling him, I said, you know, in the Air Force, we had to iron our, our T-shirts and our underwear in six-inch squares. That doesn't make any sense. And he would tell me that they used to have to tie knots. I don't know if, you got, if they, they still did, but he said he would have to tie knots. Knots that he would never, ever use, but he had to tie them and know what they meant and know what their purpose was, but he would probably never, ever use half the knots that he had to tie. Do you understand that it's not the six-inch squares of my underwear that were important? It's not the six-inch squares of my T-shirts that were important. It wasn't the layout in my drawer where I had to have my personal items in a certain setup and my, my, my military items in a certain setup. It wasn't the detail, or it wasn't the, the, the fact that I, they had to do that. It was to see if I was going to be faithful to that detail. Because they know that if I'm faithful in getting my underwear in a six-inch square, when I'm working on a billion-dollar aircraft, I'm going to be faithful in torquing every one of those bolts exactly to the specs. They're, they know that when I'm, when, I, when I'm sitting in a message center and a top secret message comes across that line, they know that I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to maintain the security and the integrity of what comes across and what I saw. They know that because if I'm faithful in the little things, then I'm going to be faithful in the big things that cause, could cause harm or death. See, in the kingdom, we don't, 
And these aren't even in my notes, so that's why I'm not even going back to them right now. In the kingdom, we don't view that same level of, of urgency as we do it in the military. See, we think picking up trash, what does that mean? Well, if we won't pick up trash here, we won't pick up trash out there. If we won't scrub toilets and get dirty and grungy in here, then we're not going to go to someone who's dirty and grungy out there. You see, it's the, it's the little things in that we show faithful that God's going to reveal the larger things that he wants us to walk in because there's not a billion-dollar aircraft at, at stake here. There's not top-secret information that's at stake here. There's something even greater at stake here, and that's the soul of another human being. Yes. And if we, 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 you notice I said we, if we can't be faithful in those little things, God is not going to allow us to be faithful in the big things. So by being late, and, and yes, you know, this seems to be a common theme. If you haven't figured it out, that is one of the things that will show honor and respect to me is being on time. Being on time to what we've committed to. If we've committed to be at a place, guarantee I will be there on time. I don't have to be told. And I, here's the other thing that I can guarantee. I can guarantee that those that have served in the military, I guarantee they're going to be there on time too. We don't know how to be late. If someone commits to do something, and, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to separate, I just want you to understand the, the ideal behind the, the principle that some of us have learned, learned something. Some of us involuntarily, some of us voluntarily, but nevertheless, we've learned something of very, very practical value that has carried us through all of our life. I was a rebellious teenager. The greatest thing for me was the military. It created a certain level of discipline in me that, that I didn't have. And it wasn't because it wasn't available. It was because it was different. My, the same things that I learned in the military were the same things my dad tried to instill in me. You understand the irony behind that? I rebel against everything my dad's trying to teach me from a disciplined standpoint. And I go to a place where it's the exact same things that he was teaching me in discipline. The spiritual disciplines that we exercise in our private life, guess what? Are to prepare us for the disciplines that we're going to have to walk out in life. And so we don't value when we're, when we're late to things or we miss our commitments. Here's the, here's the reality. We don't value our time. That's the first, If for anything else, I, I should value my time first. And if I'm late to something, I've not valued my time. Never mind that I haven't valued the time of others. And if we're not valuing our time and the time of others, we are most likely not valuing our time and our core spiritual dis disciplines with God. See, remember, faithfulness is the evidence. It's the proof of something. And so if we don't value time, talent, energy, and resources of ourself, then we're not doing it with somebody else. And most likely... We're not doing it with Father either. It's the fruit of it. See, no one will know, as I said earlier, if you miss a day. But we will know when you've been missing days, weeks, and months of intentional, intimate relationship with the Father. They knew Jesus spent time with the Father. Why? It was evident. Not only was it evident, he even said it. If you see me, you see the Father. And Thomas goes, show us the Father. <laughs> That's exactly how we are. We see the evidence of it, but we still say, show us the Father. See, just like the health app, it will reveal a lot of missed workout days, and it will also reveal a slow deterioration of my overall health or of your overall health. And it bleeds over into other areas. If we're not faithful to our spiritual needs, then we will definitely won't be faithful to our soul and our body needs. We won't get the sleep and rest that we need because we stay up all hours of the night making us so tired we miss the alarm and get up late and show up late. When we don't get the rest we need, we won't be intentional in exercise and workouts because we're too tired. When we're too tired, we lack energy to accomplish simple tasks like making our bed, washing dishes, cooking, cleaning, etc. When we're so tired, our nutrition begins to suffer and stress and we begin to stress eat. We eat fast food and we drink sodas and we do the things that we ought not to do to our bodies. All these will then take its toll on our thinking, our emotions, and our intellect. Why or how? Because we begin to lack focus. We begin to have difficulty learning and listening. And once all of these come together, we begin to withdraw one from another. 
I told you before that, that the evidence of a person that leaves a body in a gathering means that there has already been acts that were not faithful. And I'm not talking about sin. Y'all understand that. This is not just, we, we, sometimes we get this thought that when someone leaves the church or doesn't want to go to church, they're in sin. They're not in sin. Somehow they got lost in this cycle. And they don't know how to get back. One thing leads to another, but ultimately it will result in a withdrawal from the body. We've already withdrew from God individually. Then we withdraw from the body. See, we'll withdraw even from family and friends. We'll withdraw from work and church. Remember, what happens inside of us, as we taught earlier this year, will always come out of us. Faithfulness always reveals the status of our heart of love and faith, or the lack thereof. Proverbs 3, 3 through 4, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. You see, this is, this is not just, we don't just do this for our relationship with God. The net result is what happens to the souls of our community when we are not fully walking in health, spirit, soul, and body. Faithfulness is not exclusively limited to our relationship in Christ. That's just where it begins. If we're not faithful to God in our relationship with Christ, we will not be faithful in our, in our relationships with one another. In our marriages, as a parent in our jobs, with each other in the church, it all starts with our faithfulness in God. And when that is lacking, it will flow over to everything else. It begins with our faithfulness to God and overflows in our relationship with man. See, we can say we love God all we want, but the fruit of loving God, our faithfulness, will always reveal itself in our relationship with each other. How can we say we love God and forsake our commitments to each other? How can we say we love God and forsake our giving to God? How can we say we love God and forsake our serving one another? See, in each one of these evidentiary proofs of faithfulness, it all goes back to the one thing. If we're not giving to God, it's because we, we, are, we are struggling in being faithful to God. If we're not serving God... Through one another first, it's because we're not serving in Christ in the things that are important of our personal relationship with Him. If we, how can we say we love God and we forsake everything else that has to do with our interaction with each other? 1 John 4, 20 through 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment, we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Listen, none of us will say that I would purposely hate my brother. Okay? I believe that. I, I believe with all my heart that no one in this room would say that I, I, I maliciously and intentionally hate my brother. But when we dishonor and don't respect one another, we are dishonoring and disrespecting Christ. Whatever we do to one another is a direct reflection of our faithfulness to, in Christ. We may never say that we hate each other, but not showing love and faithfulness to each other in Christ is the same thing as hating him. See, none of us would ever say, I would never go to Ron and say, I hate Ron. But if I'm not, if I'm not faithful in my relationship with Ron, then I might as well just tell him to his face that I hate him. Because there's no honoring going on there. And to do that means that I don't honor or love God. I don't respect God. And that may be hard to swallow. But that's why we struggle with things. See, we would never say that I hate God. And we would never say that I hate my brother. But they're one and the same. See, James 4, 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. We know the right thing to do. None of us of a certain age, even children at a certain age, know right from wrong. But it seems like when we become adults, all that goes out the window. Did you ever think about this? Here, here. You know, I talk about the trash thing, and this is a, it's, a, it's a really good example. 
If you saw your child drop a piece of trash in your house, you'd be on them like stink. But you ever think that maybe our, our children watched, have observed us walking by trash and never picking it up? Or even worse, our children have seen us throw trash and we've just sent them a mixed message. I want you to be faithful, but I don't have to be faithful. See, these are inseparable because they are God's command. Love him and love people. To love God is loving people and vice versa. We won't love people absent of loving God. God's health app of faithfulness is revealed or measured in love. When we love people, it reveals we love God. Since the beginning of the year, especially and stress the importance of living a fulfilled life in Christ. When our spirit, soul, and body are healthy, we are the most fulfilled in Him. It's not just enough to have all this head knowledge of the Scripture and it never gets applied. And see, in contrary to popular teaching, our spirit man is complete in the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. Do you realize you don't have to do anything to your spirit man once it has been renewed? Your spirit man is directly connected to the Holy Spirit. It knows everything that you, were suppo- you and I are supposed to be doing in Christ Jesus. It knows. That's all it knows. And it is, it, is, it is constantly revealing to us and convicting us each and every moment. I just think we turn the volume down. See, he is absolutely and completely aligned in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. We transform the other two parts of our being, our soul and our body, through the renewing of our mind in the Word of God according to Romans 12 and disciplining our body by the Word of God. And Paul speaks of that in Ephesians and in Galatians and Colossians. By disciplining this flesh by the Word of God. When we are fully fulfilled in Christ, it is revealed in our faithfulness. I can't tell you how many of you, even in this room, have shared with me of a time when you were most fulfilled and how you loved being at church, fellowshipping and serving in the body and sharing the gospel in community. I hear the stories all the time from church people. It's always about a time that they were. It's always something in the past that they did. Well, shoot, I have those moments too. Some of them are crazier than others, but I have those moments. What's changed? What's changed? If the only change that has taken place is the person behind this thing right here, we have a problem. (laughs) Because our eyes were on the wrong thing. If the only thing that's changed is the color of the walls or whatever, then we have a problem. God hasn't changed. (laughs) In 2,000 years, God has not changed. Christ hasn't changed. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed. What's changed is us and who we are in Christ individually, corporately, and in community. The fruit of or the lack of that is evident in our faithfulness. Faithfulness is our personal spiritual, in our personal spiritual disciplines. Faithfulness in our church gathering. Faithfulness in our giving. Faithfulness in our serving one another has taken a hit in the church. Not just our church, but church gathering in America has taken a hit. This is not just us, okay? Y'all understand that. This is a broad stroke issue in the body of Christ. It's even even tough tough to declare that, that we are part of the body. Because sometimes I feel like we're the part of the body that's dying. Sometimes I feel like we're the part of the body that is cancerous. We're the part of the body that that has something wrong with it. And according to John, if it doesn't produce fruit, it gets pruned. If it still doesn't produce fruit, it gets cut off. See, God hasn't changed. The mission hasn't changed. What's changed is is us. We have become, as a body, ununified holistically the body of christ is really not the body of christ as he's envisioned it as he's as he has called us to be we're not unified advancing the kingdom in our communities and this is a direct result 
of the status of our health as a believer, the status of our faithfulness within the body. I'm afraid it's the evidence of the status of our individual health and faith, faithfulness, which for some of us is at a critical juncture. See, I can't tell you where that is at all. I can only look at my own health app and go, all right, James, you got to do something about this. You have to be more intentional about this, about this area and this area. See, I can only do that in my natural walk. And I, and I can only do that in my own spiritual walk. I'm the only one that can assess the true level of my heart, the true level of my faithfulness. I fear that some of us are on spiritual life support. We're just hanging on by a thread of faith, and no matter how much we treat our symptoms, we just can't seem to snap out of it. And I'm telling you, I, I, the number of conversations that I've had with pastors all over the United States, it's the same. It's, it's beyond epidemic. It's almost pandemic. See, epidemic means that it's controlled in certain places. Pandemic means that there is no control. And so I'm, I'm concerned that some of us in this body, not necessarily this church, but in the body of Christ, we're hanging on by a thread, and no matter how much we treat the symptoms, we just can't snap out of it. See, did you realize that most people on life support don't die as a result of their symptoms? The majority of people who are on life support do not die because of their symptoms. They often die because they lost the will to live. I'm afraid that some of us have lost our will to live in Christ Jesus. And the symptoms are revealed in our faithfulness to him, his body, and his creation. That's what it looks like. That's the outlook. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the apocalypse and revelation and when Jesus returns because we, we won't even have, ever have to get there. <laughs> Many of us, we're going to see him a lot sooner than we ought. Did you hear what I said? Many of us are going to see him a lot sooner than we ought. And some of us, some of us are going to be here to see that happen. And it's going to be a sad day. So I don't have to talk about turn or burn and doom and gloom. We are self-destructing as a body of Christ. Satan doesn't even have to come in and cause division. We do it good enough ourselves. Satan doesn't even have to come in and attack us. We attack each other. Satan doesn't have to come in and, and make us complacent. We're complicit. <laughs> I don't want to be that part of the body. I won't be part of that part of the body. And I don't want you to be part that part of the body. Psalm 101, if I can have the team make their way up here and we can bring the lights down. Psalm 101, beginning in verse 6. I will look with favor upon the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me he who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. I just want everyone to close their eyes while I exhort for the last few minutes and the team begins to play something softly. We are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We live in a lost and depraved world. Maybe we don't hear this enough to stir us up. It is just as lost and depraved as it was 2,000 years ago. It's just as lost and depraved as it was the day that Adam and Eve against God. It's not getting worse. 
It's definitely not getting better. We live in a world that is lost and dying. We live in a world that is hurting. We live in a world that is seeking everything and everywhere but Christ. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. We are called to minister to them, as Psalms 101 said, that as we draw closer to God in love and faithfulness, loving Him and loving one another, we become His ministers. In ministering to His creation, we minister to God. In serving his, his beloved that he has created and put on this earth, you and I and all humanity, we love and serve our Father. This morning, I pray that you hear the heart of, of God. In his health app, has alarms going off all over the place. Because the level of our faithfulness, the evidence of our faithfulness is anemic. It may even be non-existent for some of us. As I said, it's just an alarm. It's just a notification. It reveals that a response is needed. A response is, is critical. A response is necessary to move from the place that we are today to the place that He's called us to be. So as they continue to, to play softly, I want to invite you to come to the front. You don't have to. It's not, a, it's not an altar call for salvation. It's an opportunity to respond. Respond to the alarms and the notifications going off. In God's help app faithfulness of our heart. So as they play this through a couple times, you're welcome to come up and just seek God and respond in how the Holy Spirit is leading you.
lift our hands. God is a good God. And in Christ, all things are redeemed and redeemable. All is not lost. Today is the day of salvation. Today is now. I just want to encourage us this morning to begin somewhere. To find that heart that was once faithful. To be responsive personally, corporately, and in our community to the love of Jesus. It must start here in our heart first. Be encouraged this morning. God loves us. He has redeemed us. And He has set a life abundant <laughs> before us want to be fulfilled in this life until he returns and we are with him in glory amen thank you Jesus for your people and the heart of your people and their faithfulness to love you and love your creation to serve you to serve one another we just give you honor and glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we dismiss, just a couple announcements. Wednesday is, <clears throat> Wednesday is our tangible kingdom. So uh, we will pick that back up at 7 o'clock. If you have not filled out your Guest Connect card, uh, please make sure you fill that out. If you are a guest, we would like to have you fill that out. Just place it in the offering basket and we will connect with you. Um, remember, we're having Real Talk next Tuesday, September 11th at 6 p.m. And then finally on the 9th, next Sunday, we are having a planning session. So uh, make plans to be here after church next Sunday so that you can plan uh, the events for the fall that we have going. So the two big ones are the block party for Halloween and Breakfast with Santa, and there's a few other associated events that, that connect to that. And we need as many people that want to be involved so that we have enough people to, to work it, um, but I also don't want the same people doing all the planning. All right, so make plans to be, be here next week. Go with, huh? Oh, I don't have that. Becky just reminded me, there is a national night out planning at the Beeville Police Department Tuesday. I want to say it's 7. It's on the Facebook page, and I'll, I'll, I'll put out a reminder. Um, and it's for the community. So those of you that want to connect with the community, um, it's a great opportunity. If you don't know what national night out is, come see me, and I'll explain a little bit more about it. Um, but it's, it's basically where we connect with the community and the, the services, the police department, fire department, and uh, EMS also connect with the community to help foster a uh, relationship. So for us as a church, it's a great opportunity for us to help make that, facilitate that connection. So you're dismissed.